Welcome everyone. This is our uh, workshop on textual urbanism and placemaking. Um, I'm Melissa Kyle, I'm with Long Island, uh, backgrounds in architecture and planning. Um, this workshop is kind of talking about some of the intangible when it comes to downtowns and, and places. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about you know how many residential units there are and you know transit and mixed use and infrastructure and all this like very hard number of types of things. Um, here we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the, the intangibles, the, the things that make a place worth being in, why you why you enjoy spending time in a place, not just, you know, does it have the right mix of uses, that sort of thing. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of the things that make places unique and special and interesting um, and, and, and not cookie cutter. Uh, you know, as the quote, you know, men did, men did not love Rome because she's beautiful, but she's great because they loved her. Um, you know, the, the people interacting with places and how does it how does it make those places better? Um, we're going to be talking about a range of stuff um, from uh, what's known as tactical urbanism, which is kind of small scale, low cost uh, interventions that can be done at a very grassroots level, um, all the way up to larger projects and, and designs of, of you know larger redevelopment projects, and as well as also. Um, some more social and family and, and human issues as far as you know what makes places good for the people. Um, so with that, to begin, I guess you want to start, Andrea, with, uh, well, I guess we'll go down the whole panel. We have uh, Jonathan Keyes from Town of Babylon, Andrea Bonilla from Crowdsource Placemaking, um, Len Chervani from GRCH, yes, and Shaniko Levin from Every Child Matters. Andrea, you want to begin? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thank you again. I'm Andrea Bonilla, and I work for CSPI Group. Um, more specifically, Source the Station, and we do CSPM for the Huntington Station Revitalization Project. So, what is CSPM? And CSPM, crowdsource placemaking, is really a way of getting the people to have a voice in development um, and revitalization. And it's typically not done in development at all. You know, the developer comes in and says, We want to build this, and then the developer gets into it your fight with the community <coughs> and things take too long. So CSPM really tries to take the voice of the community and be a mediator for the developer and the community so that in the end, um, not only is time saved, but really the place is created for the people and not just for the benefit of the developer. Um, I took this uh, tactical urbanism graphic <laughs> from the book and there's a PDF. So it provides a vision, I don't know if you can see it that well, of the different kinds of strategies that you can do to um, enact tactical urbanism. Um, so, we'll, so why tactical urbanism? Um, as I said, why CSPM, one of the first things is real estate development is so intrinsically difficult on Long Island. Um, and just a, such a time consuming process, you know, like people say, all right, well, here's a developer, in a year we're gonna have a building, but there are so many things that go into real estate development that the average person does not realize. You know, you have to create a plan, then you have to do seeker, and then you have to do site, site plans and get approved, and then you have to state, county, town, village, all these different layers of municipalities involved. And, you know, if you do it in five years, that's a good timeline. So people don't really understand those timelines. So using tactical urbanism to demonstrate um, through small actions to demonstrate long-term change is a really good way of portraying to people what that change should be. Um, so some examples of what we've done. Uh, CSPM currently has three projects on Long Island and one in the city of New Rochelle. So in Long Island, Source Station is one of them, Huntington Station. And uh, what we've done is, oh wait, can you go back? Sorry, it's okay. Um, so in 2013, we had a really, really big street festival. We closed down three blocks in Huntington Station um, and had about five to 8,000 people come through this street festival, which really demonstrated um, what downtown Huntington Station can be. You know, people think of downtown Huntington Station and they're like, what is that, the train station? Mm -hmm. But no, Huntington Station used to have a great downtown filled with diff all different kinds of uses. This showcased that you can turn it into a place where people want to go if you have the right things. 
Um, we've also done a couple, we've worked with the local artists doing a couple of murals. Um, and Alyssa came up with an idea to do porch crawls, so we did a few of those over the summer. Um, and most recently, we did something called Gateway Nights. Um, the town of Huntington built a beautiful, beautiful plaza in downtown Huntington Station. Um, it took them about five or so years to get done. And then it wasn't really utilized by the community, so we said, what better way to demonstrate the development that is coming than by activating a plaza that will eventually front all the development, right? Because you can show people, you know, there will be buildings here, but you can, this plaza will be part of your community and something that you can utilize and not just the buildings. Um, in New Rochelle, they had an open streets thing, so they closed the streets down, no cars participate, and they had um, salsa lessons, zumba lessons, chalk paint for kids, racquetball demonstrations. Um, and so it was a really great way of demonstrating that Main Street can be used for more than cars and that all the businesses that are also there can take advantage of what the people can bring there. In Riverside, which is, if you've ever been to Riverhead, there's that traffic circle that takes you out east. So that, that little portion out there is called Riverside. It's very small. Um, but they have this one green space that has never been utilized for any public use. So they put some tents up, put some art up in the stage, had a poetry slam, had music, and it was the first time ever that people of Riverside had utilized it, this public space and really gave um, the people of Riverside a vision of what a downtown Riverside could be. You know, they don't have to just cross the river to go to Riverhead or go to the Hamptons, they can take ownership of their green space and make it into something that they can enjoy. Um, and then in Renew Hempstead is in the village of Hempstead. They did a music in the streets program where um, it was just an evening activity with music, fun things for kids, and really just creating an environment where people from the village of Hempstead feel going. Um, and most importantly, feel going at night because one of the other things about disenfranchised communities is that people don't really feel like it's a nighttime destination. You know, maybe you go there during the day, but nighttime is a little bit more iffy. So if you can create that feeling of public safety in um, a downtown, that's really good. And um, so I think just to wrap it up, the three main things about tactical urbanism that are the focus points are allowing um, people to really take ownership of the change that they can create. So for the Gateway Nights event, we had people suggested the bands, people suggested the activities. In Riverside, you know, it was like people who were doing the poetry slams. So if you let people take ownership, it says to them, all right, well, maybe I can do something that changes my community rather than just waiting for the developer to bring new buildings. Um, and we have a grant system and for all our communities actually where we're giving uh, small grants for community members who can create tactical urbanism events. Um, and the other thing is working with municipalities to also use this as a public involvement thing because municipalities typically, you know, they either have their planning department or work with developers, but don't really do a lot of the short-term ter actions, and if we can get them on board, then it's also good for them because people can see that they're working for them. Okay. All right. Um, I was going to say, we're going to switch to the next one. If you want to get ready, see what we're going to Uh, my name is Jonathan Keyes. I'm the director of the Office of Downtown Revitalization for the town of Babylon. Um, we were created about 10 years ago, and our mission is specifically to work on bringing new development to the historic downtowns within the town and also areas around train stations um, within the town. Um, so in particular, that has 
uh, led us to do work in Wyandanche, Copeg, East Farmingdale, and North Amityville. Um, I wanted to speak just real briefly today uh, on one particular aspect of tactical urbanism, specifically related to um, what we can do with our streets and roadways, um, and then just show a few examples of what our office is doing and what we hope to do uh, related to that topic. Um, so I thought Andrew made a number of good points that that type of urbanism is really about getting people to re, um, reconceive the, uh, our public spaces and think about them in a different way. Um, so for streets, so much of what makes a good street is a little bit beyond our control. The, uh, the, the shape and the infrastructure of the street itself as well as the buildings that frame it. Um, so if we consider that in the short term those, those attributes are fixed, what are the, the types of things that we can do? Um, within the right of way that uh, maybe reallocate space a different way and help us perceive things a different way. Um, so I want to show a few examples that sort of uh, range across the spectrum of intervention into, into streets and, and to demonstrate um, the types of uh, changes that might be possible. So there are large scale investments that could be made um, in a particular, uh, if you think about this, this one example, this is uh, down in Dallas where they recently have decked over a highway and turned it into this really magnificent park. Um, it's, it's near the art museum, right outside the downtown area, um, and it's just been a great success for the community. Similar conceptually to the Big Dig in Boston and the, the Kennedy Park that they have there towards uh, the waterfront. Um, obviously, massive investment, and this is a permanent change. However, we can achieve the same sort of inter intervention on the next slide. Um, this is at the opposite end of the spectrum. It's a very low investment for less than a day. The, the nature of the intervention is exactly the same, um, just on the complete opposite end of, of the, uh, the investment in temporality scale. Um, likewise, we could think about uh, outdoor dinner party. Um, this appears to be on some sort of freeway, but it's clearly in a very dense urban area. Um, so there are, is the, the potential to get a lot of people to have a, a massive event like this. Um, but you don't need to, to have a dense urban area to accomplish this. It could be accomplished with the most suburban of all traditions, um, which is, on the next slide, the, the block party. Right? <laughs> um, so again, still the, the, same, the same concept behind the intervention just totally different scale of urbanism. Um, and the last attribute would be uh, this example of, of skill. Clearly takes a lot of talent um, and artistic ability to pull off this sort of reclaimed intersection here. Um, but on the flip side of the spectrum, there is the next slide, which is a pattern that my five-year-old draws on our steps every <laughs> weekend in the summer with her sidewalk chalk. Um, so you don't necessarily need a great deal of skill to, to pull this off either. Um, so these, the, the, the second of each of these examples um, kind of demonstrates and drives home exactly what tactical urbanism is all about. And the phrase coined by uh, Eric Reynolds is lighter, quicker, and cheaper. Um, so just to use that as framing for some of the things that we are trying to do in Babylon, I'll show some two specific examples. Um, the first is in Copeg. Um, and I'll use this as an opportunity to promote the fact that our office has recently rezoned downtown Copay to attract and allow for more dense uh, mixed-use development in the area right around the train station. So that's Great Neck Road running right up and down the middle of the screen and, uh, and the railroad tracks, the elevated tracks you can see going east and west. Um, right within the downtown area, um, there's an approach called Marconi Boulevard. Pardon me. Um, that doesn't really lend itself well to pedestrian activity. And here's a view of it. Um, it's not the worst street in the world, certainly, with the buildings being up front against the, uh, the sidewalk. Um, it, what this graphic doesn't really quite communicate is how wide this street is. And immediately behind this viewpoint, there are some auto body shops and a lot of really not so great downtown uses. Um, and this is, again, a main approach right to the main commercial corridor at Great Neck and the train station right nearby. Um, there is a lot of parking demand for the downtown, and we are, uh, in our new code, trying to allow for shared parking and reduce parking requirements for new commercial development. Um, and we're trying to offset, with the, offset that with the provision of more public parking. 
Um, so we looked at this road as an opportunity both to increase the communal pool of parking and also an opportunity to shrink the road a little bit. So one of the concepts that we drew up in-house with SketchUp, which is a really great tool for trying ideas out, and I would highly, highly recommend it. It's totally free, um, recommend it. It's really easy to figure out. Um, we had a, a part-time student at Farmingdale came in and whipped this up for us, um, and it's been really helpful for us. So basically, just take Marconi. You can see the post office again here. Paint, very classic city DOT example right here, just you know, green paint and planters and, and crosswalks, a really cheap intervention. Adding head and angles parking. You just kind of scroll through the next couple of slides to get an idea of what we want to do. Um, so we're just working through a couple of little details with this, and we hope to have it done, if not this winter, then next spring. Um, so that's one example of, again, light, quick, cheap, just throw some paint down, and you've totally reinvented the road and hopefully uh, encourage people to walk a little bit more. The second example is a little less tactical in nature, um, it rather allows for future um, tactical urbanism, if I could say it that way. So this is, did you go back one side? Sure. Yeah. This is downtown Wyandanche, it's currently under development. Um, the train station is right here. The uh, first building is completed, occupied, under, and this one is under construction, should be completed in just a couple of weeks. The town has constructed a new public plaza right in the, the heart of this community. And for the roadway that bends around the plaza here as it leads us to the train station and the train tracks, um, we wanted to really establish a strong sense of place at that location. So if you go to the next slide, just again, here's a few points. So you've got a road passing right around the bend here, the train station, a little plaza area. Um, so rather than have that be just a traditional road, we designed and have just recently installed uh, a paver tabletop on the next slide you can see that is flush with the curb. Um, this was just taken last Friday. It hasn't even uh, opened yet. Um, if we go to the next slide, really basic concept, but uh, all of these bollards are removable. The park is right here, so what we envision this being one day is a space where we can shut down the street, remove the bollards, and have just a continuous flow of pedestrians between the plaza and the retail storefronts and the train station for things like outdoor concerts for um, you know, community gatherings during the holiday season and, and things of that nature. So this is, again, decidedly less tactical based on the attributes I spoke about at the beginning, but it is hopefully establishing a forum for smaller um, community events as we, as we go to the future. That's, thank you. that you're looking at right here is this space right here. So the surrounding buildings here, back here, and what you go around here, are these design buildings here. It's called the Piazza Ripley Cove because it's certainly a Mediterranean feel to the design. This was part of a overlay study that, that Glen Cove did that sits inside that. This was really one of the linchpins within the village. This is slated to begin the first part of construction in the spring. Uh, it is based in gr ground floor retail with multi stories of residential above. There is the original design concept is for uh, open, open apartment housing and graduate student having housing for local colleges. So I can't say that we're creating a destination point because the destination point already exists. They have a summer music festival, there is a plaza there. So did we improve it? Well, we doubled the size of it. We have roughly 26,000 square foot of 
central core plaza area. So we certainly created a lot more space for, they have, the ho they have holiday events, the summer program, and now that there is going to be surrounding retail, um, there, there is much more, a much better reason to come to this part of the street because right now it's a 19, early 1960s office park and it's, it's three quarter vacant. Um, so it hasn't, it, it hasn't kept up and it hasn't done very well. And, um, but we're, we're very proud of this and we're looking forward to this being built. Could you go to the next slide? I, this one is actually something that was very, very current. We just did a, for Vision Long Island, we, on behalf of Kings Park, we did a walkthrough of Farmingdale Village. And one of the, and this was for one of the biggest concerns of people who live in these communities is, oh, you're going to turn me into the city. We're going to look like the city. We're going to, the streets are going to close in on top of me, and I'm going to lose my, my, the feel that I've had since I've lived here from day one. And we, my office created this image, um, which I intend to use for Kings Park. Is I'm sure you figured it out already, but this building, and then we go down to essentially one story till we get to this building. So through Photoshop, which is not free, by the way, <laughs> at all. Um, not our version, anyway. We then copied this and showed how um, filling this in here with similar style architecture here, exactly the same model style architecture um, on on the main street. Is it the goal of this? Is is it really that bad? I mean, is 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 what? Vision Long Island is, is contemplating, discussing with you and bringing it to you. Does, does that change the streetscape negatively? I mean, our opinion is no. Our opinion is that we're taking an existing architectural element and carrying it forward. And by doing that, now sometimes, yes, where the, the idea is higher, not three story, but four story, five story, yes. And we've done that. But, and that's what the prior picture was, Glen Cove, that's four, five, and six story. But that's not on top of Main Street. If you notice, there's, there's the piazza in the last picture, and it's all set back. So on top of Main Street, I'm, here I am talking more about the last picture, but on, on that Main Street photo, those buildings were four story, and the back was five and six story. So we treated, we, we did pay homage to Main Street, not to overpower it. In this one here, this is just a, a study to show residents potentially in Kings Park that by doing some infill it's it's not going to destroy you downtown. Could you go to the next poem? Okay. Across the street from that building that you just saw is this. <laughs> this is one story of uh, um, empty properties that um, all under, again, the Farmingdale vision study that allows for higher density, more height, basically intensifying your property. So that image there is fully under construction. It's fully framed, steel frame. The roof just was going on yesterday. And this image is to show that, okay, this, this one, and again, we, we did the same thing. This is three story, and back here is another, it steps up off of Main Street here. But the idea behind this building is when you look at what's currently there now, and you, and you look at what's being proposed on, on the Main Street, we're not proposing just a straight line box, a, a vertical wall of nothing but windows and brick. This, this design took into account that how, how it faced itself to Main Street, how the experience would be walking past the, the building and actually um, 
and even driving past a building, that the experience would be not just a flat plane wall, as you can see. We, we have a lot of intricate ins, ins and outs in the front, balconies, setbacks, and a, and a beautiful ground floor uh, office slash retail strip that will um, maintain the Main Street shopping concept, obviously. We're not, we're never looking to take that away. Main Street is a, Main Street is for shopping. That is the idea. Made more and more Main Streets becoming by eating, but and, and who knows what this, th these are actually designed small enough, but that's probably not going to happen, and that was intentional, that these will be more office and, and, and dry store than, than any kind of food service. And in the back, which is what is back here is hidden, is the parking, ground, ground, uh, ground floor parking area. So, so we're not always saying that we're going to take a one-story building in, in these walkable environments. You, you have to incentivize the property owners to want to do, to, to want to do something. This is a, this is an eight million dollar building, replacing a fifty-five cent piece of junk. <laughs> it's the same owner. He actually owned this property up here. And he's the same owner down here. So. Um, we're not saying that it's, it's not going to look any different, it's just going to look nicer. No, obviously this is significantly taller, the, the mass of it is significantly greater. But if we can replace it with something that is by far um, architecturally, aesthetically outstanding, I, I think it's, it's worth the trade. And I, think, and I think most people, and most people agree with Palmingdale, especially the municipality, have agreed that this is worth the trade. And it's worked for them, the downtown. Not, not too many people yet have taken advantage of this, this Farmingdale Village overlay, but more and more are coming on board. And even this particular property owner is bringing, going to be bringing more on board. So eventually, although it's going to be a main street that's much taller, yes, um, and it's not all going to be new, as you saw from the prior picture, it may just be simply a property owner may want to build two stories on top of what they already have. That may just be a retail store right now. Now we can do some apartments above. The parking, the, park, the, the amount of municipal parking in this village is plentiful enough where most of Main Street can take advantage of it. Could you just go to the next one? Uh, actually, the last photo was just really all three, um, all three together. It's okay. That's it was just the three together to just look at them all at one time. It's okay. Okay. It was really just the three of them that actually you can see right. the prior ones to them. So okay. thank you, thank you very much. So I am Shaniqua Levin, director of Irish Child Matters on Long Island, who is a part of a national organization. We are a nonprofit organization and we do advocacy work when it comes to children's issues. So why am I here? Why are you here? Let's start with that. <laughs> What's your name and tell me why you chose to come to this workshop? My name is Paul Musso. He sucked at me. <laughs> <laughs> I told you to go home. <laughs> He's a great guy. Um, he actually uh, brought me down. I'm a, I'm a broker realtor. Okay. And some of my clients are here. He recommended me a good name to get some education. Ooh, okay. How about, we can go right. Go ahead. Um, I'm actually in the Urban Placement Institute, so, um, okay. I'm Rosemary Viscali. I'm with Transit Solutions. It's a program at the MTA that promotes transit, and I also chair the Car Free Day Long Island event every September 22nd. I know this might be something to do with Car Free Day. Okay. So, Paul Patty with ListNet. We're an uh, organization, a nonprofit as well, that supports the tech industry on Long Island. <laughs> We partner with um, co-working spaces called Launchpad and are looking to do more projects like this around Long Island, so that's kind of why I'm here. I went there for the first time uh, a like few weeks ago. Yeah, I was like, what am I walking into? This is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Hi, Nina McCann, Director of Marketing at Fricelli Carter. It's a real estate law firm, so it's really just one really strong Okay. Um, I'm Nina Rowell, I'm a writer and editor. Uh, work for New State. Section and you now I work with a lot of other organizations, traditional now, and uh, following smart workers. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Peter Perot. I work for AKRF, an environmental planning and engineering consulting firm. And we do a lot of projects, including many of the ones that were mentioned here today and have been able to participate. So we look forward to continuing those relationships. Peter, you took what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it all, and I also worked with AKRF. Uh, Jonathan's been a long time client of mine uh, at the town of Babylon. And I wanted to actually find out some of the other stuff that they do that I'm not involved in uh, to, to hear about it. So, okay. uh, Greg Del Rio, the RBA Group. Plan, I'm a planner engineer. I work on a lot of complete streets and revitalization projects. Okay. Karen Montalbano, president of the Golden Civic Association. We have been trying to get this type of development within our community, and I keep searching for different ways of trying to get in. <laughs> Uh, Kevin Crean with the Anessa County Office of Housing and Community Development. So we have funding to uh, help the communities improve their downtown. And, um, so we're involved in a couple of projects that are being talked about today. So I actually came to get an update on Glen uh, Cove and uh, see what's going on. Um, Margo Cargill, I'm a consultant, also president-elect of the Union Dale Chamber of Commerce. So we're in the midst of lots of development projects going on and we're looking at areas like Baldwin, who do have um, substantial, you know, developments on the horizon, and looking at how we can use those kinds of um, developments and, and projects to look at and bring bring to our community as well. I'm David Sabatino, a planner for Regional Plan Association and a small business owner in Nassau County. <coughs> Jeremy Levin. Uh, that's my wife, right there. <laughs> <laughs> I was also suckered into coming here. Well. <laughs> this is, this is Somebody's going to take my picture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the advisory board for Every Child Matters, and, and this is tremendously interesting as um, a resident of the town of Huntington, and just seeing the communities where things are being revitalized um, on Long Island is, is tremendously interesting and uplifting. So I'm here to kind of just see what's going on. Neil Takamoto, CSPM Group Managing Director. I work with Andrea. Leah Delares, I'm from Los Angeles downtowns. I'm here um, to support and listen to Andrea Vanilla, who is a colleague of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Gilman. I also work with Andrea. Um, I guess we have a team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Loretta Wilson, and I work with Andrea, and it's been fun. <laughs> I'm Keith Brown. I'm with Andrew also. <laughs> I'm with Andrew also. <laughs> She's got a support team. I'm all back around. Are they kidding? I'm really kidding. But that's huge. Oh, Krauss? I actually, yeah. I actually yeah. am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jim and I work a lot together. We, okay. I'm a zoning and land use attorney here in Melville. I do work from, as I like to say, from North Hempstead all the way up to Montauk. Mm. Okay. And I'm with uh, Bowler Engineering. We're site civil engineers and we do work in every town. And personally, I'm very involved in the town of Huntington. So mm. okay. we hear about projects there. Okay, so you fooled us. But you know, we actually said we were going to heckle her. So. <laughs> Well, thank you all for sharing, and I, I did that for several reasons, you know, I know it's late in the afternoon, <laughs> I saw a few yawns, <laughs> so I want to, you know, get you going, I'm not going to keep you forever with myself anyway, but also just to see who's in the room, see who's like-minded, who's thinking the same things that you are thinking, when you may want to partner or collaborate or brainstorm, you know, sometimes we just have to get to know each other a little bit. I, so I'm here as director of Every Child Matters. I'm also a native Long Islander. I grew up in Glen Cove, um, and now I've lived in the Huntington area for 13, 14 years. So, um, and my organization covers all the way from Long Beach to the Hamptons. <laughs> so, Every Child Matters Long Island represents the whole island. And what we represent is the community's voice for children's issues. Right? So I'm not going to talk to you about all the advocacy stuff today. <laughs> That's another time where we could definitely talk later because I do presentations to chambers of commerce and things like that, so I would love to speak with some of you later. But my importance of coming and speaking with you today is about some of the things that some of them have already mentioned. 
a lot of what's being included is with mind of family and people and what we want to see and what should be there and how we can go about doing things, whether it's on a bigger scale or a smaller scale. And why is that important? One reason is when we feel better, we spend money. <laughs> and ultimately, <laughs> we want your business in there that's going to have people spending money, right? And make it look good and want people to come down there and spend their money. <laughs> so when there's things there, we can bring, and I, you know, I'm a parent, I have a 17-year-old, and I have a 12-year-old. And I remember I was a stay-at-home mom for seven years. And I went around my town looking for any and everything there was to do. The isolation was so crazy. You're sitting there, you're talking to the child all day long, you're worried about it, you know, you're like, oh, we're going down the steps, so this is a refrigerator, let's count your clothes, oh, that's an S. You know, so it's like all day long. So I mean, where's the playgroup at? You know, what's going on? Oh, the library. The library's awesome because they have mommy and me's. Let's go to the park. Huntington has a nice, you know, park right in the village. There were things like that to do. I would have loved a sprinkle of park. Me and my friends, because, you know, then I joined some mother's groups here and there because, of course, I had to join everything. <laughs> um, sprinkle of parks. It's such a great way to have other businesses there locally because we want to eat too. We don't want to, you know, we can pack our lunch when we need to, but we'd like to have that option to go eat or to go have other things in the vicinity. So if you're thinking of like a place like that where, you know, whether it be a sprinkler park or, you know, whether it be a playground area, but other things too for us to go to. We like, and I, I know I keep thinking of food though. We like, <laughs> we like ice cream, we like things like that. We like places to have mommy in these. We like places where, you know, we can go and it can be existing buildings that are already up, existing stores, maybe they're not open that day. We can tap into the talents and the resources of the community. They're pretty, they're licensed, you know, people in the community that either are working or are working will be loving to give up some of their time to offer these things to community members. Um, having time to even come out and read books in the park and the beautiful nature days where you're taking children, you're looking at butterflies, you're doing outside, outdoor classrooms. There's lots of ways that with its current businesses that you can think of how to partner with them either when their doors aren't open or part of when their doors are to bring some of these things to them. Or like your pop-up events. We love those things. <laughs> we get it on our calendar and don't make us register because we'll be there like two hours before registration is even open. <laughs> And we don't mind paying something also to get these. We're looking for things to do. We want to take our kids on bike rides. I want to teach my child. I live in Suffolk in Huntington, and there's not, there's not many sidewalks. Sidewalks I didn't realize were so huge until I moved from Nassau to Suffolk. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized how big of an important sidewalks are. They really are. Outside of you know feeling safer when your children and you are walking from store to store. Um, being able to bring their ride-along toys when you're going to meet with your friends at their office for lunch or something. Because we still try to, you know, when you're at home, you try to keep your foot, one foot in the work area and one foot at home. You got your kids and toys and your friend that's still working understands. <laughs> but we're in places like that that is outside of an office environment where we can meet with them and just maybe have a park bench to go eat at. You know, there's little things like that. There's, um, programs that we can have that help you did the whole mural thing and stuff. I thought that was awesome. There's things that we can do like cultural fairs. People love to get home. I love that dinner, that community dinner. I would love to be there. That's so awesome. Oh, like a taste, a taste of all the businesses where you come out and all the businesses have some food to sample and, and you can buy them as well and you get to see what's in your own community. And we get to have our children come out and experience stuff that they would normally tell us no, but we can at least give them a chance because if their other friend is eating it, they're probably going to try it. <laughs> but if we bring it to them, no, but it's a waste for them to experience with our community. I know in um, Huntington we do this um, Halloween trick-or-treat where we go out to all the businesses and there's a parade and things. 
we go in there and we're like, oh wait, let's stay in the store a little longer. Because I didn't know they had this and I didn't know they had that. Now we're trick-or-treating and I got bags with me too. <laughs> so, um, what about you? You're creating some parking spaces and stuff. We love those expected mother parking spaces. We love either one with the toddlers and stuff, because even when you're not riding one, you have these big, bulky car seats that's done some damage to my back. <laughs> and then you gotta find the sharp car and kind of plop it in. So that's another parking space, too, that would be really helpful. And we like to go to those stores. You get excited when we pull up and it says, expect to mother, or whatever. It's like, yeah, that's me. And then you look if someone's not in there. <laughs> and you better make sure they come back to the car with a belly or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, family trails. Not everybody likes to go into the woods. I do, we hike, but not everybody likes to do that. But you can still create trails and fitness little stops along the trails in these local downtown areas. Like they do in, um, I think, of Comstack Park. Anyone been to Comstack, those little trails there? And there's a little fitness stops, so there's a little pavement too. There's little things like that that we can get out and do. And again, it gets us appreciating the environment that we have. And next time someone hears about a project you're creating somewhere, we're your mouthpiece. We're like, oh great, they did this great thing out there, now we can do this and that. We want to rent public spaces. Some of us do live in apartments, and we want to be able to throw barbecues and have a graduation party without having to go to a hotel um, to rent out something, or the VFW, I love the VFW, but you gotta buy their drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and those things are crazy. <laughs> but we would love to have, like, you know, a local community center or something with multiple uses that we can rent out and imagine something like that if you've got the community involved from the ground and planning it. There's so many resources and untapped things that the community members would even be willing to offer and do. You can even do that in a current business. You know, have certain, you know, um, have an author come and read to the kids at your business. Um, let's see. I did this one part. Um, the the out, outdoor concerts, those are awesome, and the movies and things like that. That can, I think Newsday even does that on the grass, so if there's businesses that has lots of lawn. It's Newsday. Everyone's begging for these tickets to go onto Newsday's lawn and get and see this movie, and they have vendors out there too, and it's a movie we've all seen before. <laughs> so again, we want to come out, we want to have you revitalize our communities, we just really want you to think about how family and children can really benefit in everything you do, because once we come and find out your establishment, we will be your mouthpiece. Very good. shown the example in Copeg of how you're just going to use paint and striping to, to, re, to transform the street. And I know there's been examples, you know, in here um, and other places of other um, kind of temporary, you know, one of the aspects of tactical urbanism is it's not necessarily just about re-envisioning the space, but you can also test out ideas. Like before you spend $800,000 to reconfigure an intersection, you know, you can go out there with cones and hay bales and planters and, you know, set it up and let people drive through it for a week and see if it works as well as it is designed. I'm just wondering if you or any of those of any other example. I'm not familiar with any examples of that on Long Island. I don't know if anyone but that's that's something that's, you know, um I mean that was a huge motivating factor for us, yeah. Yeah. That that and the fact that we didn't really need to get you know, we weren't actually physically changing the intersection of the county roads so we don't need so right. additional levels of sign off on it. Okay. But, that's, um it was it was Really easy, okay. quick, fast implementation. That's good to know because I know a lot of projects in these downtown revitalizations, a lot of more on good county examples. and state roads, yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of them. I know. I mean, I live, you know, stone's throw from one ten, and you know, when I, I, you know, I always knew it was kind of a terrible road to live next to, and then when I was pushing a stroller and working from home. I became very aware of it, really how bad it is and how terrible it is to try to cross that street. And, but to be able to try to, to test things out, you know, without having to go through you know, 15 years of planning process and just, you know, putting a pedestrian on it. You know? <laughs> um, 
Yeah. No, it kind of brings up a good point in that, uh, you know, we often see with public projects that there really isn't a good vetting process because, I mean, I could think, you bring up New York Avenue and Andrew's working in Huntington Station. I mean, I remember when the DOT went through there, they just put up a retaining wall on the east side yeah. as you get towards the Big H shopping center. Yeah. You know, and they, they threw it up, looks like total hell, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, they did, and they, now they've done the rest of 110 all the way down to uh, the expressway, and what's really interesting, they put in great landscaping north of the expressway all the way up to Pine Lawn, and then nothing beyond that, you know? And so I was talking, because it's a big issue for the Chamber of Commerce now, and it just seems to me that a little bit of public vetting for some of these public projects could get some input where, you know, they could change it before it, it goes into construction. So the good thing about tactical urbanism is, is that it's also described as a good tool for municipalities to really test the waters because so many municipal projects take so long, right? So you can just have someone in the planning department say, all right, let's rope off this area, turn it into a park, and see what would happen if we had a referendum for open spaces, set aside this much money, actually got the you know 60% supermajority that we need to bridge that 2% tax cap. So you can do that in a week and say, all right, well, this work that's gonna take five years is going to be worth it. Um, and that's what like municipalities also need to take advantage of because they can do that, right? They don't need a permit to rope off an area and turn it into a park for a week, test it out, see if people go, see if people don't go, is it gonna be safe? Um, are you going to be, you know, should you fund your public arts program? What what public arts do people <coughs> want to see? You know, we know that art revitalizes, so how can they do that and use it to do short-term things? You know, paint a couple of murals, have a couple art installations that are going to transform the area rather than we, you know, you have to put it up to bid. And so municipalities can take advantage of tactical urbanism and all the strategies. They can close off a road for a day and say, here it is. This is what it could be if you had a downtown here. Yeah. Andrew, I'm curious, you mentioned before that you have grants that you can provide. Where does your funding come from? And it, was, it seems like these are municipalities that would hire you so to test out ideas. But CSVM Group um, works with Renaissance Downtowns. Renaissance Downtowns is CSVM's group client. Um, and so as part of our funding for all the community work we do, um, this year we started testing out grants. So it's uh, right now we have a $500 grant, one $500 grant. And we just had a mural artist who applied for it and is going to do a live mural at a holiday event we have in Huntington Station. Um, so she's just going to prep it. She's either going to do it live on a business wall if she gets the permit, the permission from the business owner, or it's going to be a new moving community mural that can um, float around at community events. Um, so that's one. And then for the 2016 year when we reviewed our budget, we're going to have seven grants, six $250 grants and one $500 grant, and they're going to have different focuses. So the community picks what they want to focus on. Um, the Huntington Station community recently just picked um, education, children, youth, um, cultural events, beautification, business development, and public safety. Public safety is like a, one of the biggest uh, perception issues in Huntington Station, I would say. And I would say perception is, I don't think it's unsafe. Um, so, but people have this bad perception. So if you can get someone to maybe apply for a grant that can enact a tactical urbanism thing, like as simple as, you know, getting some new lights somewhere or doing a nighttime walking event with people to really showcase that it's a safe place, and you just do a small scale event, you apply for the grant, um, if you get it and if the community supports it, and then you can showcase really through just one day event that you can have a long term change. Great. Um, Jonathan, with your um, tactical that you're doing in Cope, um, if you're not already planning to do it, please invite a whole bunch of the other implementers in the counties and the towns. Because as you probably know from our experience, we've been pushing for that so much. Test it, test it, test it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, yeah. so far in Long Island, it's, it's, down it's there to... you know, <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll show it off if it, if it yeah. works. And if it doesn't work, <coughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hoping it is good. Right. You know, I'm hoping that really opens yeah. the eyes and we can start. And as you mentioned, that some of those parking needs were very um, um, uh, 
who are identified by Greg as part of the management workshop that he led for Pope and Pope. And that was the genesis of a lot of the stuff I showed. Well, I think also the good thing about stuff like that is it, for whatever reason, it doesn't work, which I don't imagine it would, yeah. but you haven't invested that much. Exactly. So it's not like some bonded thing, you know, I want to have a million dollars, yeah. and, you know, and then it it's fails. Shame. And, you know, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just some painted planters. You know. Um, just to connect the point about the public vetting to crowdsourcing, I mean, many of these processes are publicly vetted in these formal meetings that nobody goes to. I mean, most, the most recent thing I can think of is the 109 debacle with the, with the trucks. State DOT put, put out the public notices, they informed the legislature, you know, they informed no the elected officials, no one showed up, and it happens. But, I mean, here we have a perfect example of, you know, crowdsourced pla placemaking that connects people in a way that they're increasingly using digitally and in person that we could use to publicly vet government yeah. projects. So it'd be nice to see the government use crowdsourced place making as a way to vet their things. On the tactical urban si urbanism side of things, I was part of a, I guess you call it guerrilla painting. We painted a mural on the side of the Long Island Railroad uh, overpass. And believe it or not, the MTA and the Long Island Railroad did not mind it as long as no one said anything about it. Okay. So it lasted for six months until somebody that doesn't particularly like paint said something and they painted over it. But the point is, these agencies that might be hard to navigate aren't so uh, unwilling mm -hmm. to participate as long as you give them some cover and some space. Um, so the opportunity for tactical urbanism working with these larger organizations and agencies that seem immovable mm -hmm. is there. I think it's also important to have established relationships. Of course. Like slowly introduce the idea because when we tried to do Gateway Plaza a couple years ago, Tom was very hesitant, we weren't as far along in the process. And now we said, hey, let's, you know, we have the seeker approval, let's really show people what having that building in the back with retail restaurants and apartments can mean for that plaza that was such an investment for the town. Right? You can bring the food, you can bring the entertainment and say, in another, you know, 24 months when this building is done, this could happen all the time, right? And so then they're like, oh, okay, well now, you know, we're further along down the path and we can envision this. Yeah, I think, I think that plus is a great example of, of, of how something maybe could have or should have been done tactically to begin with, because once the building is built <coughs> around it, it's gonna be this fantastic place. But in the, like this, in the meantime, it's this plaza with you know, it's a beautiful plaza, it costs a lot of money, it's very nice, but no one's hanging out there right now because there's nowhere nearby. So it's like, you know, like, it could have been something where, you know, maybe use that somewhere else to do like a kind of a tactical plaza while you're waiting for, for, for the development to happen. Um, so that it doesn't look like, oh look, our, you know, our town spent all this money and no one's even using it, even though people will use it, they're just not necessarily yet. Or at least, you know, except wait for the bus. But. <laughs> um, yes, go ahead. Question, uh, question for Glenn. He touched on this briefly, but one of the reasons places like Huntington Launchpad have been successful is they've kept a lot of open space. And in the tech industry, we face a lot of companies losing uh, employees to companies in the city that have these cool layouts and these other things. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of interior space, whether on an existing building or new projects, and making that be something that will attract people and, and you know allow them to you know enjoy their work a little more. Well, I think you and I had a conversation at the vision last meeting. Yeah. You were telling me about your yeah. your space, and it was really interesting. Um, and I think part of the model is inexpensive space, right. and you you do a shared space, right. right? And they are popping up quite a bit. And actually, the one um, the one image I showed of the new building in Farmingdale, I said that the commercial space on the ground was actually very small. Right. And it doesn't support most traditional retail and delis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, pizzerias. It's, it's, it's a shallow depth. That is the kind of space. It almost, if you've seen the model for loss, mm -hmm. right? So that's artists working from home living and working from home, and they have the one at Patchogue has all of the, um, the, the ground floors are, are like walk-in retail stores mm -hmm. with full glass and door. I hope you don't go down there in your pajamas in the way. But <laughs> that, that type of space is, is perfect 
right. I think, for what you're doing. Right. Because, and if you're downtown, you're fully exposed, the space works, it doesn't work for a lot of other things, but your model is small. Right. You know, inexpensive, small, and that's, there are a lot of those spaces that exist. And in terms of new, yeah, the goal for new is usually, if there's no issues with site, 80 foot deep, biggest spaces you can get for the retail. But a lot of times retail does not drive these projects. All, all these big projects you're seeing, it's the, it's the rental. That's what's driving it. The retail is really a little bit of, you know, well, we're supposed to be downtown in the retail. Right. But everything above it is, is residential, because they're getting, they, they're getting good rents. I mean, I know he's probably not supposed to say that, but, right. but the reality is the, the apartments are what's driving it. Right. Now, if you look at white edge rising, that's, you know, that's from scratch. But you look at the project in Farmingdale, it's an existing lot. And it's not a particularly huge lot. We had to put parking on the ground. And it created that, that you know, not exactly pristine right. size shape. So I think in these older downtowns, like Vision is talking to Kings Park right now, and, and Farmingdale has already had their vision study, and they've already done their overlay study, and as more of those buildings come online, they're going to experience the exact same thing. And they're going to have those, because you got to put parking somewhere, right. and they're going to have the exact same type of commercial spaces that are, you may have too many spaces to choose from. Right. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, I could think of that being a pretty cool place to, yeah. pretty cool place to work in downtown, right on, right on Main Street. Um, this is not a question right now. Um, one of the things that, that I was thinking as presentations were going on, and uh, you know, we tend to design for ourselves. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm just thinking the, the types of spaces you always hear about are you know the spaces that those of us you know you know past college before retirement, a lot of us you know places things we like to do, um, but to really make places really good for everyone, for all um, all members of our community, is really think about a space, like how would you experience a space if you were eight or if you were 80? And, and how do we design for, for you know, the, the ends of, you know, the uh, either ends of, the, of our life cycle? And I was, I was thinking almost, you know, rather eight, you know, 18 months, you know, when you've got little kids, little toddlers, what, how do you design spaces for them, places for them, and how, um, do we integrate spaces for, for all ages and demographics into our downtowns? And uh, you know, the, the, the kind of idea of the, the third place. You know, we have our home, we have our work, and then we have where we spend our free time to enjoy ourselves. And then how do these places, you know, incorporate, you know, for all people? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to touch on that or just, I'm just throwing the idea out there. Of, you know, how do we design for, for all members, not just those of us who are, uh, you know, of working age and... I, I, I would at least say, I, I don't know if I have a good answer to that, but I would definitely confirm that having kids radically change my perception of the downtown area. Definitely. Like, and, you know, I never really thought would happen, but mm -hmm. um, even just the fact of walking around pushing the show is such a different experience. I'm very aware of the purpose. It's, it's, yeah, it's serious. You don't even realize it's going to happen, but it, yeah. it does. <laughs> The first year that it's um, being uh, taught, mm -hmm. um, and it's I don't know placemaking as a field is sort of just coming into mm -hmm. the fields of like architecture and planning, just trying to kind of insert itself into all these other mm -hmm. uh, disciplines. So there are going to be people who are like specialists in placemaking mm -hmm. who like will be able to answer all these questions. But yeah, I think that's one of the things we're trying to kind of get over is that myself as the liaison for Huntington Station, I am never going to know everything that the community wants and neither is the person in Riverside or the people in your Rochelle. So that's one of the goals with our grants is that people can kind of create their own programs. <coughs> because, you know, Lucien had this idea for a mural that I would have never thought of and somebody's going to have an idea that focuses around children that I would have never thought of and 
someone's going to find an educational form of tactical urbanism that I probably wouldn't think of. So if you give people the power and a little bit of motivation, which is the idea behind the grants, then they're going to take that on. And they're going to say, all right, well, I have you know 18 month, 24 month old kids, so I think this would be a great way of transforming a place. Or the person that says, I've been an educator my entire life, this is how education transforms a place. It's like you are always include like your family support principles and have the families and part of decision making from the ground up. So that way they're part of the process and you're always getting their buy-in and feedback. And there's so many community or groups and things that can, you know, elect a family member to or you know a family representative to be on your committee. <laughs> like, you know, to give them this entitled and they would be all buying for it. To give, you know, to be able to give their input. But the thing is you want to create that from the beginning. Like when you're creating these spaces in Glen Cove. Are there going to be places, you know, and if we want people to go walking and down around the downtown, is there going to be a family bathroom? Something like that. Something where their dad is walking with a stroller, he can go in the bathroom, have a changing table, have the space to do all this, and mom and grandma as well. Changing table in men's rooms. Like, I, I don't know why this is such a rarity. <laughs> right, have more That's than one. That's so tactical. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's so tactical. <laughs> Need more women's rooms and bedrooms, you know. Um, you want to incorporate things. You want to have, like, if there's office buildings and stuff. You want to have, you know, maybe if there's a small, say, like a basketball court nearby. And one of the reasons is you have the young people in the community looking up at those people working in the office. They see themselves working up at that office. They themselves start to have pride and want to work harder to do things like that, become a better member of the society, and hopefully someone that is working in that office. So the, the people, I think, will come if you make it nice enough and make it functionable to where we can go there and just grab our bags. Grab our bags and know that once we get there, everything else is going to be taken care of. Yeah, so you'll have to pack your whole house with you. Yes. <laughs> just for a short time. Yes. <laughs> Yes, totally. Yeah. And another, another exactly from, on. right from the ground of engaging them in all of those pieces because again they feel ownership over it, and then they feel like they know what's going on. They're the mouthpiece out there talking to the community about this. Everyone's getting excited, and it makes them feel like invested in there and wanting to stay in this community because they helped it. Their feet is in the ground. Their roots are there in the community. Another place that I love. And um, you know we used to sneak into because you only can you have to be a Smithtown resident in order to drive your car park, right? Oh, yeah. So it's um, it's uh, Hoyt, I believe it's Hoyt yeah. Center, and it may, I think of it because it caters to multiple ages. It has a sprinkler park. Um, it has a little area, picnic area, um, for us to relax and watch and see the see the kids. Then it also has another side where it has picnic tables and things like that. And then there's a petting zoo back there. Well, no, not a petting zoo. It's kind of like feeding. <laughs> I know they have some animals back there, and we would from our house we would bring carrots and things like that to feed them. We made that a whole day. Now, if you had some businesses there and things like that, we would have bought money to spend there, too. Just to add on to your comment, um, also about the connections. I mean, we always talk about that in planning, and specifically in transportation planning. Not all of the downtowns have everything within it, and they're not always going to pack. So the connections to the library or the post office or the train station are maybe a little bit further away are key, especially for the old and the young. Because um, making that connection for me with my son is, is a lot easier to walk than getting in my car and driving five times. Right. Getting in and out of car seats makes you really think twice about it. Exactly. <laughs> right. Am I going to go? Absolutely. Right. And if you have a little small community where you pick up something on the way for dinner. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know. That actually reminds me of something. Um, I guess maybe I'll just throw this out to everyone and whoever wants to try it. Idea, but there's a, a sort of tactical um, thing that I've been wanting to do for a while, and I was inspired when uh, my wife wanted to take our kids out to the Children's Museum of the East End over the summer, and she wanted to take the train out there, which she was able to do 
but only after going up to Google Maps and Street View and looking at the route that she would have to walk mm -hmm. to, um, see if it's really to make sure. So uh, it, it just got me thinking that it would be nice if you, you know, say you arrive at a train station, it may tell you that the East End Museum is a five minute walk, but it doesn't really tell you what you're up against. <laughs> so any sort of icon, like a walkability icon, you know, shaded in 75% of the way, or it tells you that there are sidewalks all the way, stroller friendly, or whatever it might be. Um, so that when you get before you, st yeah, before you start to try this one, yeah. You know, what you're into. Yeah, there's actually some, we actually have a sister project in Nashville who did this. Um, and you can put up signs of, like the distance to certain public key places and what that walk is and what that means. And way signage is like one of the easiest ways to transform something. You know, like when we talk about like, oh my god, there's no parking. Most of the time there's parking. Yeah. You just don't know where it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Like, yeah. it's, yeah. you know, yeah. in Huntington, they change the signage for parking and all of a sudden there's parking. I mean, there's still a problem, yeah. but it changed yeah. things dramatically. So if you can just say, hey, the library is too blocks this way, the bus stop is, you know, three steps this way, and then people are all suddenly like, oh, there are actually things here we didn't know about that we can take advantage of. Right, so, I would, you know, if I wasn't from Huntington, if I got out of the Huntington train station standing there, I'd think that there was absolutely nothing to do anywhere, because <laughs> you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere just surrounded right. by parking lots, right. but having a sign saying, you know, the village is only a mile and a quarter right. this way, right. you know, so which true. you wouldn't really know otherwise. And then another thing with, you know, including families and, and things like that, is mentorships. I have, um, you know, our advocates, we have about 400 advocates in our in our database, and um, some of them are from the towns we've mentioned, in particular from Cove, um, and they were concerned about the new waterfront that was going up, if it was going to have things for children to do, and it was going to be easily accessible to children, and then I started asking around, and I heard that might be phase three. <laughs> so when people start speculating and don't know 100%, then they start getting, oh, I don't know, that doesn't seem like it's for me. Another way is offering mentorships. Partnering with the high schools, if you're coming in to build a new project or you're creating designs, ask the high schools, they'll send you one or two children, you know, from the community just to shadow you while doing this. Because now that person's going to the, the school's going to know about it, they're going to be entering to want to come and shadow you, their parents are going to be knowing about it, they're going to know that, oh wow, this community project that's coming in is giving my child a chance now to see other careers and other options that may have not been, that may not have been even in their thoughts or their minds. And now they even want to support your project more because you've included their children or them in it as well. So internships are, or not even internships, mentorships. Mentorships of like, you know, what is architecture? What does this mean? You know, what is, um, you know, engineering? Is this something like, what does it really look like on my day-to-day -day job? Having some kids come in and shadow and just be part of the process or the board meeting. You never know what's going to pique your interest and that may be the next person working on your team. Um, I just want to give a little shout out to Vision because I've been working with you guys for a while. And, uh, when I was uh, I was covering real estate in the, in the late '90s. And you say, uh, I have to say, you know, you said words like you know, Glenn was, you said like density, or affordable uh, housing. You were like subject to public stone. Yeah, seriously, or apartments. Yeah, well, rent, rentals, like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. So, <laughs> nobody knew it now. I've been told not to use that term. Yeah, we, we still Back struggle with uh, you know. Yeah, we still struggle with the word urbanism and, and how well or not it's accepted. Right? Yeah, but, yeah. But I think, but, and I think, you know, we, we sort of lose track of how far we've come mm -hmm. in a relatively short time. That's and true. I think it, to me, it kind of um, reveals some of the underlying fallacies we had about you know, suburban America, which is, you know, my family came out here from Brooklyn, right? You know, to 1955, and you know, <laughs> 1951, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, and my grandfather's like, but why are you going? Where are you going? You know, Long Island, Long Island. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and we were, you know, we were rural farm delivery hunting. It wasn't even a dress. But I think what 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 happened was that I think that. I mean, I would just be interested in people's comments. I mean, so to have a normal conversation about these issues, to me, showed that, you know, when we moved to the suburbs, yeah, we might, we might have wanted, you know, a little bit of green, a little bit of housing, and so forth. 
but we didn't want to leave the community behind. And I think that's what happened, is that people all of a sudden came and said, wait, you know, we like community. Whether it's you know a bigger community of a city or a smaller community, and that many of the pre-car Long Island was actually small cities built along transit-oriented developments along Long Island Railroad. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess my only question is, you know, what it seems that like we're, we're having normal conversations about smart growth, mm -hmm. but what what do you guys see as next? Are there things? Are there still obstacles you're trying to face? Are there issues you're trying to deal with? No, I mean, yeah, we've definitely come a long way, yeah, because, you know, when we first started talking about this stuff, people looked at us like we were just insane. Like, who, you know, no one wants to live in town. Who wants to live above a store? Like, come on, who's going to pay money to live there? Um, so we've definitely come a long way. I think, I think now we're just trying to really, I mean, for me at least, that's, you know, part of the reason why I really want to have a panel like this is, you know, we've, we've kind of gotten the concept of that, yeah, let's put housing near the train station. And you know, let's mix uses, and, and yeah, places have to be pedestrian friendly. But I think really getting the how to do that well, I think we're still. I mean, some places figure it out better than others, but the, the how to implement it and, and do it in a really good way that really is not just you know making a place walkable. Well, it's got a sidewalk, but you know, but is it interesting? Is there something that makes a pedestrian want to be there? Um, do you feel comfortable? Do you feel like you're in an outdoor room? That sort of thing. You know, we're still I think trying to figure some of that out. I mean, some of it we've gotten in some places, you know, some places we've still got a little, little to learn. I think that's, I mean, from my perspective at least. Yeah, I know. think we also have like really good ideas for the future, but a lot of these things are going to take a lot of time. And we've gotten a really long way, but they're still going to take a long time. You know, like whatever development in Huntington Station is going to take at least another year, if not two. <laughs> now, people ask me that every day, yeah. but it's just the reality of it is, you know, all of the processes that you have to go through, nothing happens overnight. You know, this isn't like bar where you just go to town hall and say, hey, I want to build something, next day you're in. This just doesn't <laughs> happen. <laughs> so this, I think, is really important so that you can show people small, tangible changes that are really going to represent the big changes down the road. Because people start to get doubtful and, like, you know, rumors start to happen and all these things and they're like, oh, well, you're never really going to get in the ground because you're already three years in and, you know, God knows when you're going to happen. So if you can start showing people the small the small actions that are going to represent the change in the long run, then you're really going to make a big difference because then those people are going to care and say, all right, it's worth me staying here another five years because there is going to be positive change. It's worth me getting involved in my community because then I can even start one of these projects and become a real you know, knit person with my community, then it's worth me getting to know my neighbors, and it's not just like, all right, well, maybe someday development will happen, maybe it won't. Maybe we'll get the infrastructure, maybe we won't. Yeah. Andrew, I, think, no, I really think you hit the nail right on the head, and it kind of ties in. It's a good summary of what we're talking about, because Jonathan, actually, his example is really pointed that out, you know? A little change here or there, you know, and you start to, you know, win people over, because, you know, I remember, was a back, you know, having conversations when we were at Vision Huntington, yep. and there was a lot of cynicism out there, just in terms of, you know, change in general. You know, that people always are afraid of change, yes. and, and that's when a you place make those that has a downtown, has a physical built example of what we're talking about right there. Yeah, you know, so try talking about that Brookhaven. When you start with the little changes, you know, with the streetscape, you know, I remember advocating down um, in our town hall. We're just doing some improvements right around the train station, just mm -hmm. with landscaping or, or hardscaping or doing something to make the appearance of the place look nicer. And you know, and then you build on that, you know, and then eventually you get to, to Glenn's projects down in, in Glen Toes to create new spaces. But I think it's those those little victories will help you along the way to, to achieve the, the greater result. But I, I think when Vision first came around, because they had no success stories then there was, there was nothing to point to and say, it works. Right. Well, why should we believe you? It, all all right. this is is talk. Right. There are so many success stories now. There are so many towns on board with this. And even within their planning departments, pushing for it. New towns that have been stagnant and waiting on a sideline for all these years, seeing what's been going on near them. I, I, you know, the floodgates are open. 
there's really, I mean, success breeds success, and it's not going to, until, some, until somebody finds the floor in this system, it's not going to stop. They're just not seeing the negative to it. it every town they see doing it is re reporting good things. So they're gonna, it's going to continue. I see it, as far as the future goes, I see it getting um, even ramped up a lot, much greater. Even in towns that we would think would never do it. We have more time, but if we want to wrap up early, I'm sure everyone's trying to get home. So, <laughs> unless, unless there's any other questions, I think, you know, thank you all for coming. Thank you.